Hello, Hillside in your home. We're so glad you're joining us today online to worship from our home to your home. Um, we're going to lift up God together and we're going to worship and hear from the word. Um, and this is just going to be a little bit different. Um, but as we follow God, we know we can worship him anywhere. And uh, we know he's sovereign in everything. So I would love to read Psalm 145, 1 through 3 for us to start us off. Um, and to let this truth sink in, and let's just respond in worship. Um, here's what it says. I will extol you, my God, O King. I will praise your name continually. Every day I will praise you. I will praise your name continually. The Lord is great and certainly worthy of praise. No one can fathom his greatness. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was asleep to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. When the sun sets free. Is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. When the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen. Let's sing that wherever you are. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. When the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, 
Father, thank you for sending the only salvation 
that we could have through your son dying on the cross for us in our place. Father, we, we look to you in this time of need. We trust you, Father, for no matter what the future holds, you are on your throne and nothing changes that. Praise you, Father, for nothing changes that. And I pray that we be bold in the name of Jesus for nothing holds you back. Nothing holds the gospel back. So I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that during this time, we run to you. We don't run to isolation. We don't run to sin. We don't run to temptation. We run to you. And I ask you, God, to speak. Speak through Dave as he gives his word, gives the word, your word to us. We worship, we live, we, we find our being in the name of Jesus. And in that name we pray, amen. Hey, Hillside, in your home, from our home, Brooke and I want to welcome you into our home. We love you. We miss you. Um, and you've welcomed me and us into your home for a long time. And so in these crazy times, we wanted to welcome you into our home. In fact, if you walked right upstairs with me, you'd, you'd see the Tooker memory wall. Every trip we take, every vacation we take, we, uh, we buy something or grab something to remember it by. And a while back, one of you got us SeaWorld passes, and my family went to, to SeaWorld. And it was the first time my son had ever seen uh, the steel eel. And he looked at me and said, Dad, I want to go on that. And so we, we, I, I was hoping he was going to be too short, honestly, because I don't do roller coasters. But he was tall enough, and we got on. And uh, man, if you've ever been on the steel eel, it, it is a crazy, crazy ride. It reminds me a lot of what's going on right now. I mean, twists and turns, you can't see what's coming. Uh, it's overwhelming. But up on our memory wall, it's one of my favorite memories ever um, because they took a picture of us midway through the ride. And my son had inched over and he was incredibly close. In fact, my arm around, is around him and he's holding on to me. You see, in the middle of the chaos um, of that ride, it didn't separate us. It actually brought us closer. And he'll say, that's been my prayer for you as we go through this crazy coronavirus, crazy time. It's a crazy wild ride, unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, our prayer for you as the body is that this wouldn't separate us. In fact, this would do uh, what, what trials do, what God intends them to do. It would bring us close. Uh, that we would find opportunities to love and serve and care and share. And so we're going to continue to walk through Acts. We've got the perfect passage today. This is going to be a, a message of hope, a message of encouragement, a message of, of strengthening. From my heart, um, this is a message, Hillside, where I simply say thank you. You guys, because of God's graciousness and your generosity, Hillside's going to be able to make a huge impact for the name and fame of Jesus Christ. And so this is going to be a message where I simply say, well done and thank you. And so it's going to be an Acts. We're continuing to look at how the church advanced through adversity. The church has always advanced through adversity, not in spite of adversity. God has always, always, always used adversity to advance the gospel, the name, and the fame of Jesus Christ. And it's what he's doing now, even in our day with the coronavirus. We may not see it, but it's always what God does. So let me read the text to you this morning. I'm going to go Acts. Uh, we'll go in chapter uh, 4, 32 down through 511. So long scripture. I'm hoping to keep this at about 20 minutes. So I'm just going to give you uh, some really high points that you can um, take and, and apply. In Acts, verse 32, God says, Luke writes, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own but all things were common property to them. 
And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and they kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, uh, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him. And after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, Why is it that you've agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they, were, they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over uh, the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Now, Hillside, let me give you a big theological perspective uh, as we jump into this. To read straight through the Bible is to understand something about God, uh, and, and it's this truth, that God is generous. In fact, God's so generous and He loved this world so much that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, the small theological picture, what we all struggle with is this, that sin is greedy. Sin is afraid of scarcity. It's scared of not having enough. And so sin seeks to be greedy and to take, and it causes conflict and dissension and strife. It separates us. The Bible tells the story, we call it the gospel, the good news of the generous God who entered a greedy world and he gave himself for us. He gave himself to us that he might dwell in us and live through us that we, uh, the children of God, might have what the scriptures say, abundant life, life flowing out of us. In a world of greed, we're going to be a people of generosity. Now, what we're going to see as we walk through this, I've already said it, the church has always advanced um, through adversity, not in spite of adversity. Now, now, get this. I don't want you to miss this in this text. We could come at this from numerous angles in this text, but I want you to see this. Last week we saw that when the Spirit of God filled the children of God, they spoke the word boldly. And so they were bold in word. Today we're going to see not only were they bold in word, but they were bold with their wallets. You see, they didn't just preach one thing, they practiced it. You, you tell your kids this, we talk about this, we use words like this, Talk is cheap, words are cheap, uh, and it's true. In order for the gospel to advance through adversity, hillsiders, we're going to need to be bold in word and bold with our wallets. We're going to see an amazing text today. Before I jump into the text, I'm, ne- I'm going to need us to agree on something because when we get down to the end, um, we have to have agreed on this to make sense of this. Do you agree that we all want a world where there's no need? Do you agree? Do you want a world where there is no need? Like there's no needs around you. 
you see, it's a, a huge point for us as Americans. In fact, we started the war on poverty in 1964, 65, 66. We've been fighting poverty because we as a people want a world without need. We want people to have their needs met. What we're going to see today is how that world, how that kingdom, how that place can be. You have a world with no need when you have a world with no greed. And we're going to see how the gospel removes greed so that we might be a people who meet need. We're going to see how the gospel changes our hearts, changes our heads, frees our hands so that we can repent of greed and be a people used by Jesus to meet needs. Let me jump into it. I'll show you. He changes our hearts. He changes our heads. He changes our hands so that we might be a people who meet need. Watch this. Start out verse 32 and open your Bibles. I'll read it with me. Here's how, how it starts out. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. You see what the gospel does, it begins, it's altogether supernatural. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how to be moral people, better people, how to try harder and do more. It tells us how God supernaturally takes out our hearts of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. Uh, right now in the world, you have a whole bunch of people with hard hearts, and hard hearts seek uh, to store and hoard and keep for themselves. When the Spirit of God fills the child of God, He removes that scarcity, that fear of scarcity, that fear uh, of not having enough, because what He does is He gives us abundant life where we understand our God will meet all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And so what the gospel does by the Spirit of God regenerating us, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, He gives us new heart. He takes us away from scarcity mentality, scared mentality that separates us from one another. And He gives us a sufficiency mentality uh, where we share with one another. Um, I guess the best way to share this with you, and I think I've shared this story with you before, uh, when I was seven years old, that's the age of my uh, youngest son, Paxton, uh, every single Saturday we would run down in, in, to a store in Gold Beach, Oregon. It was called the Candy Apple. It was a candy store. Uh, they only sold candy. So every week, uh, each of us, each of us boys would get 25 cents and we'd ride down to the Candy Apple. One, one Saturday, it only happened once, but we went in and the store owner knew us because it was a small town, a thousand people, and he knew that the Tooker boys came in on Saturdays. And this Saturday, he looked at us and said, boys, this Saturday, everything is yours. It's all free. Take whatever you can take. It's all yours. And my brothers and I were absolutely overwhelmed. The fact that somebody had given us everything, they paid, they paid for it. And so we began to stock up and store up on candy, and we went home that day. And it may have been the first time in the Tooker house the boys actually shared, because we had enough. We had more than we needed. We had all the candy you could imagine. You see, that's the gospel if you read through this book. Our sin has overwhelmed us. We're, we're stuck. We're, we're doomed and damned and destined for devastation and destruction. And God says, your sin has been removed in Christ. It's all paid for. It's all free. If you'll simply repent and bow the knee, put your faith in my son, Jesus Christ. This is what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. It is by grace that we're saved through faith and not of works. It's not of yourself. It's nothing you can do. It's a gift of God um, that he gives to you by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that truth changes our hearts. It sets us free. The gospel is that Jesus paid it all. And only that truth is strong enough to melt the heart of ice, to melt the heart of stone, to move us from scarcity to sharing mentality because God paid it all through His Son, Jesus Christ. So they were of one heart, one mind, one soul. They continued together. You want a world without need? You need Jesus Christ because only He can give you a new heart. Now watch where they go from here. Unbelievable. Not only, uh, still in verse 32, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Now watch this. Not one of them, very interesting word, not one of them claimed. Not one of them got their identity. Not one of them believed that anything belonging to him was his own, 
but all things were common property to them. And with great power, verse 33, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Not only does the gospel begin by giving us the power to live this life, by giving us new hearts, the gospel gives us new heads. You see, something happened at the fall. It's bizarre. But we began to to find security and significance in created things. Paul says it really, really well. He says, because of sin, we worship and serve created things rather than the creator God. And so we literally will spend our lives chasing after possessions and stuff and hoarding stuff and holding on to stuff. In fact, this is what, because we believe, uh, we claim that certain things are ours, This is why we have division and conflict and separation and strife. That's what James says. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you, y'all? Why do you fight? Why do you quarrel with one another? Is it not your desires, your lusts, your wants that wage war in your members? You want and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you murder one another. It's goofy, it's bizarre, but this is the thinking of the world. If I have more, I'll be safe, I'll be secure. What the gospel does is it gives us new heads, new thought patterns. Literally, Romans chapter 12, we're not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, He gives us a new way to think of it. I think it's what I learned when I rolled my parents' second car. I'm not positive about this. I'm not sure the chronological timeline. Um, But one day I was driving my dad's car and I was reaching over for some candy, some gummy worms in fact, went into the ditch, the car started rolling. I didn't have my seatbelt on, I hit my head. Um, Well, I hit my head really hard and I literally didn't know much of what was going on around me but I did know I lost my gummy worms. And so I began to walk down the road and pick up gummy worms. Somebody saw me after the car wreck and said, what are you doing? And I couldn't answer them. Uh, I had hit my head during that fall so bad that it had scrambled things. I I was really doing something stupid, walking down the road, picking up candy gummy worms. What happened at the fall when sin entered the world is that we got very silly and stupid. We as humanity began to love stuff and use people to get more stuff. But what the gospel does is it gives us a new heart. It frees our heart in an abundant way where love begins to pour out. Then it begins to transform our heads where we don't claim our identity from stuff around us. We don't find our security and significance in stuff. Let me tell you this. This is a true fact. Fact. What do you have, what do you possess that you did not receive, Hillside? And if you received it, why do you brag and boast like you didn't? Everything that you and I have is a gift from God. Everything. And let me tell you this. Whatever you possess, if you can't freely give it away, you don't actually possess it. It possesses you. And what we see here is a people that no longer found their identity, security, significance, value, meaning, purpose, and worth from stuff, but they began to use stuff for its created intended purpose. They used stuff to worship their Savior and love the saints. And that's what we're gonna do as a people of God. He gives us new hearts, abundant life that flow out. He gives us new heads, new thought patterns where we no longer claim that anything is ours. Nothing's yours, bro. Nothing's mine. Look around, this, this house isn't mine. It's a gift that I get to steward to invite people to meet Jesus. Now, not only does he give us new hearts and new heads, watch how this frees up our hands to worship and serve our creator. Go verse 34. Some of you really aren't gonna like this. You Republicans that are hardcore Republicans, you're probably not gonna like this, but let me walk you through it so I can offend everybody equally. Verse 34. For there was not a needy person among them, For all those who are owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. And they would lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. 
Now, here's a little story of that, verse 36 and 37. Now, Joseph, a Levite, a Cyprian from birth, who was uh, also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. And he owned a tract of land and he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Um, You see, it's not until God's given you a new heart. Generosity doesn't come naturally. Greed comes naturally. Generosity is supernatural. And it's not until God has given you a new heart with this abundant life, this overflowing life. It's not until he's given you a new head um, to interpret the world around you and not love stuff, but use stuff to love people. It's not until you have those two things that he'll free up your hands to generously give. But as Christians, we're the only ones on the face of the earth who can give generously because God has given everything to us generally. Generally? Totally messed that up. He's given to us very generously. Now, let let me get into the part that is going to twist some people up. And I've even had a sociology professor tell me, uh, Christianity teaches communism. Did you you see it there? Uh, I'll read it to you. And and we'll just jump into this. Just give me two and a half minutes on this. I won't spend a whole bunch of time on political theory. But watch. There was not a needy person among them for all who are, verse 34, owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, um, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. That sounds like communism. Here's the thing. It's not communism. Communism is so a, a forced confiscation of goods. Communism is where the means of production is, is governmentally owned. We happen to live in a capitalistic system where the means of production is privately owned. And to our north, we have socialism where the means of production is publicly owned. Here's what people believe. We all agree there's a problem because there's need around us. We see the need. Um, all you have to do is drive through San Antonio and you'll see the need. In a broken, fallen world, we've come to believe that some system will take care of that need. And so if you're in a capitalist system like we are, we believe that, man, socialism is the way to go. We need to be socialist. That'll remove the greed. If you're in a socialistic system, they believe communism is the way that'll remove the greed. Here's the truth. This does not teach communism. This isn't forced confiscation. This is gospel generosity. When people had new hearts, new heads, and it set their hands free to sell possessions and give generously to the needy. You see, here's the truth. I don't care what system you live in. There is no system in this world that can remove sin and remove greed. Whatever system you have, there will be greed, whether it's on the individual part, the social part, or the governmental part. Systems can't remove sin. Only a Savior can do that. And His name is Jesus Christ. He can remove sin. He can remove greed. He can fill our hearts with abundant life and free our hands to sell and to give generously because he has given everything to us generously. Now, here's what what I want to show you in this. Hill said, right now we're going through a wild time. People have lost jobs. People have had their hours cut back. There's all kinds of need. Here's what I want to tell you. In your life, there are times that you will be needy, And in your life, there are times that you will be needed. Our lives go between being needy and asking for help and being needed and giving help. Most of us find our identity in one side or the other of that equation. Most of us like to be needed. It feels strong. Man, we like it when people need us because we're the strong ones. We don't like to be needy because it feels weak. Um, It feels like failure. It's really hard to ask for help. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Everything that all of us have is a gift of grace. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells us, even if you're rich, to you rich folks out there, you're not to put your hope in riches because they can be gone overnight. Don't believe me? Read through the book of Job, yo. It can literally be gone in a second. So if you're rich and you're like, I'm strong, I'm needed, um, I'm not weak, each side of that equation is going to teach us humility. And so I'm going to tell you a quick story about what drug and alcohol rehab taught me. You see, I thought I was strong and I thought, man, I'll never be needy. I'll only be needed. I'm just going to be strong. 
Well, then the Lord allowed crisis and chaos into my life, and I lost everything. Um, I, I walked with, with you, Hillside, through that time. I remember getting up um, and confessing to you. I was broken. I, I had nothing. And the most amazing thing happened. You see, I couldn't find a job after rehab. I went through at least a dozen interviews. And I don't know if you've ever been to that place where you're utterly helpless. You've sat in job interview after job interview, and you've been told no again and again and again. You begin to feel overwhelmed with hopelessness and helplessness. The truth is, all of us find times in our life where we're needy. And all of us find times in our life when we're needed. The gospel frees us to speak truth, and when we're needy, we simply have to ask. We ask our Father who gives every good and perfect gift. Not only that, He's put the church here so that you, those of you who are needy at this time, all you need to do is ask. We have put together uh, Hillside. We're a family. We're a body. We love each other. And we are, we've put together what's called Hillside Helps. So if you go online and you look it up, you can see that there's a place there. If you have a prayer request, you, just, you can email at prayer at hillsidefellowship.org. If you have a need and you find yourself in that place where you're needy, um, Hillside, you have been so incredibly generous. Because of God's grace, God's goodness, and your generosity, we are in a place where we can make sure that there are no needy among us. See, I told you last week, the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. And the Lord Jesus Christ has set up the body of Hillside Fellowship in such a way where we are going to shine bright during this time. I, as your pastor, will tell you boldly and confidently that there is not going to be a needy person among us. So all you need to do is to go on, on hillsidefellowship.org. You go down to Hillside Helps page, and there's a form there. If you're needy, you fill it out, and you let us know how we can love you, how we can serve you. I don't care who you are. If you're, if you're elderly and you're on a fixed income, I've already gotten a number of emails. Let us know. Uh, you're not alone. Jesus sees you. Jesus cares about you. And Jesus has put the body of Christ here to meet those needs and to love you and to let you know he sees you and knows you. If you've lost your job and you're trying to figure out how to pay the mortgage and make ends meet and you're part of the body at Hillside, you get online, you go to Hillside Helps. You're not alone. Jesus sees you. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you, and Jesus has put Hillside Fellowship here to help meet that need so that there will not be a needy among us. You see, the gospel advanced not just through boldness of word, but boldness through, wall, uh, through our wallets. And Hillside, you've been so generous that we get to meet needs. If you're a single mom and you're just trying to make it, I want you to know Jesus sees you. Jesus knows. Jesus cares, and he's, he put you as part of a body that wants to walk alongside you that so, so that together we can proclaim there will not be any needy among us. Look at how generous our God has been. He has met our every need through Jesus Christ. He has given us new hearts, new heads, new hands so that we get to meet needs together. So if you have needs and you find yourself in that position where you're needy, please let us know because there is not going to be any needy among us at Hillside Fellowship. Now, this is the church's time to shine. This did not catch Jesus by surprise. Um, because of God's graciousness, your generosity and your leadership's frugality, wisdom, we have got resources to meet need during this time. This is Hillside's time to shine. But if there's not going to be any need among us, there's also the opposite truth to that, that there cannot be any greed among us. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Watch the holiness of God take place. You see, we all wanted a world without need. You agreed with me. But to have a world without need, you've got to have a world without greed. And to have a world without greed, you've got to have justice. And to have justice, you've got to have judgment. Watch what the scriptures say. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. 
And that's fine. And they kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet, which is all fine and good. Here's the problem. Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed? You've lied in your heart. You've not lied to men, but you've lied to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife, Sapphira, came in, and she didn't know what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me, Sapphira, whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you've agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. Man, whenever, whenever Jesus is at work, the enemy's seeking to counterfeit it. And so whenever Jesus is doing something big, the enemy is seeking to do something bad and counterfeit it. And there was something so beautiful about the body of Christ that had new hearts, new heads, and new hands, and were freely giving and sharing that the enemy wanted. He wanted to distort it. He wanted to pollute it. And so he had Ananias and Sapphira come in and be hypocrites, deceivers, and liars, and try and act generous when they were actually being greedy. Now, that's what the enemy always does. He tries to stop and thwart what God was doing by hypocrisy, deceit. And I know some of you are going to hear that. Some of you who don't know Jesus are going to hear that and say, God did what? Did I just hear that right in these 11 verses? Yeah, God killed them. He offed them. Ananias and Sapphira are dead. They fell dead. They dropped dead. And, and I know what you're going to say. How dare God do that? God can't just kill somebody. He can't just take somebody's life. That's harsh. That's cold. That's cruel. That's unloving. I can't worship that God. Slow your roll, bro. Hold on. I thought we agreed we wanted a world without need. Do you still agree you want a world without need? Well, if you want a world without need, you've got to have a world without greed. And if you want a world without greed, you've got to have justice. And if you're going to have justice, you've got to have judgment. You can't have a world with no need and no judgment. It's philosophically, intellectually impossible. I think maybe the problem that you have with this text isn't that God took their lives. It's that you and I know that we're no different than Ananias and Sapphira. And if we're honest with ourselves, when we sit and look at all of our possessions and we think about giving them away, we can't. We can't because we don't possess them. They actually possess us. And you see, if we're going to have a world without need, if we're going to have a church without need, we've got to have a church without greed. And if we're going to have a church without greed, we've got to repent and deal with our hearts that love stuff. This, this is actually really, really good news for Christians. You may ask, how is Ananias and Sapphira dying good news? Well, we know that judgment fell on them because of sin. And you and I know judgment is coming. God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge this world in righteousness. Through a man, he's appointed heir of all things. His name is Jesus Christ. And so as we look into eternity, we know judgment's coming. And this is actually why Christians celebrate. This is why we call it good news, because judgment already fell. I'm no different than Ananias and Sapphira, and you're no different either. And we look at what Jesus Christ has done and realize Judgment has fallen. Death has come. But it didn't come to me. You see, Jesus Christ came, and the one who knew no sin became sin for us. 
He took the punishment. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised and crushed for my iniquity. Judgment came, friend. Judgment for my greed came and judgment fell, but it didn't fall on me. It fell on Jesus Christ, who although he was rich and possessed all things, he humbled himself and gave up all things and became poor so that you and I, by grace, through faith, a free gift of eternal life in him, we were poor, but he gave us his riches. Free gift, man. Free gift. This is the good news of the gospel. He was pierced through so that we might have peace with the Father. So Hill said this, this is the good news. He's given us through his son, Jesus Christ, new hearts, new hearts that are filled with abundant life. In fact, Romans 5, 5 says, the spirit of God shed the father's love abroad in our hearts so that love flows over. He's given us new heads where we don't find our identity and our stuff anymore, but we use our stuff to love our savior, to love the saints, to love the sinners. And he's given us new hands to freely give as we've received. He'll say, I want, I want to just thank you. I want to thank you for your profound generosity. You have given so much that we have bountiful resources. Thank you for, for having new hearts, new heads, and new hands. I want to tell those of you who are needy right now, please go online. Go to Hillside Helps. Go down to the Hillside Helps page. Open it up. There will be a form for you there that you can fill, fill out. The gospel has always advanced through adversity, not in spite of adversity. In Hillside Fellowship, this is our time to shine. If you're in need of prayer, you feel isolated, you feel, you feel alone, email your prayer uh, to prayer at hillsidefellowship.org. We'll get back to you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Hillside, you're not alone. Brooke and I love you. The team and I love you. We are with you in this. We are for you in this. And I can guarantee you, one, there's not going to be any needy among us. But the darker the night gets, the brighter the light shines. Hillside, this is our time to shine. So until next week, I look forward to seeing you again. I love you. I'm for you. God bless you, Hillside Fellowship.